Barnum. Uh, he's going to tell us about entropy majorization of thermodynamics in GPTs. Right. Thanks, and uh, thanks for. Uh, Let me give this talk. Um, I'd just like to point out my collaborators. Uh, Jonathan Barris is sitting right over there. Uh, Marius Proom and Marcus Mueller. Uh, Marius is a, uh, he's going to be a uh, PhD student at uh, Western Ontario, where Marcus is also moving. Um, all right, so this talk is sort of the beginnings of a project to understand thermodynamics by investigating properties that are necessary for a generalized probabilistic theory to have a well-behaved analog of quantum thermodynamics. And we're thinking of quantum thermodynamics as a resource theory. So we want to know what, what um, transitions can you make from one state or another given some means more general than the most general transformations in the, in the probabilistic theory, um, which we refer to as thermodynamic means. Um, so maybe you'll be able to bring in Reservoirs and do certain kinds of interactions with the reservoir. The reservoir has to be in a Gibbs state. Uh, that's sort of the approach of um, uh, the authors of Second Laws of Quantum Thermodynamics, which include Brandau, Oppenheimer, Venner, Lung, and probably some others. Um, so there's a whole recent um, surge of work on quantum thermodynamics applying to microsystems and looking at what transitions you can do by thermodynamic means. Uh, that I think has been really a huge advance in physics. Um, and uh, the authors of this have talked about transitions between energy diagonal states. Uh, these guys have moved into thinking about uh, states that aren't necessarily energy diagonal and what is the role of coherence and decoherence. Um, so we'd like to understand these ideas a bit better by generalizing them to um, probabilistic theories, maybe even understand a little more, more about what singles out quantum theory um, is it the only theory with a reasonable thermodynamics? Um, if not, what other possibilities are there? Might they be reasonable possibilities for new physics? Uh, we're just going to lay a little groundwork here. And we're actually going to assume uh, spectra. So we're going to assume something that Carlo just showed you, some axioms that you, you can derive it from. Um, and, and there are other works. Uh, Alex has written some papers where um, spectra pop out from some other assumptions. And I... Yeah, there, there may be others, but um, Alex being Alex Wills. Uh, we give, uh, right, so, so the main sort of technical result of the talk, we're give conditions that are sufficient for operationally defined measurement entropies. So where we take a fine-grained measurement on a system, we look at the uh, probabilities of the measurement outcomes and look at the entropy of that, you know, or the min entropy, or the max entropy, or some Renyi entropy, any sure concave function, actually, any function that's mon monotonic under majorization. Uh, and these conditions will say that um, choosing the spectral measurement, the measurement in the sort of diagonalizing basis that Carla was talking about, is actually the one that minimizes this entropy. That's um, probably important for thermodynamics to work well. Okay, and we may get into von Neumann's argument uh, for why the quantum entropy is the thermodynamic entropy. Um, you can kind of generalize that to our setting. I'm not sure if I'm going to uh, get to that, actually. Um, okay, so what's the theory? Uh, I think people pretty much covered this. It's a set of systems. We're going to specify them by bounded convex sets of allowed states, which we usually call omega. Uh, allowed measurements, allowed dynamics compatible with each measurement. You can view it as a category. Uh, you'll need to add a little bit of structure to the structure of a symmetric modal category. Um, you want this normalization process, which is basically the deterministic effect. It's like taking the trace in quantum theory. Um, maybe you want composite systems, rules for combining them. We won't need to talk about that much in our approach. It could be based mostly on single system properties. Uh, it's a pretty weak framework, and it's operationally justified. Uh, sometimes people worry about that. Uh, I think it's pretty reasonable. Okay, more formally, um, we've got a compact convex set of normalized states. Let's take a rebit whose uh, normalized state space is just a disk, a, a circle filled in. Um, and that's a mega, maybe, our normalized state space. Uh, we normally think of a cone, so that's just closed under addition and uh, non multiplication by non-negative scalars uh, in some real vector space. 
So we normally stick this into a real vector space whose dimension is one larger than the affine space spanned by states. Uh, here's the origin of our real vector space. And then we make this code over, right? So that's the positive semi-definite matrices in quantum theory, for instance. Uh, it's just the positive orthant in classical theory. Uh, properties of that cone are going to be important for us. That's why I, I mentioned it. OK. Um, measurement outcomes, they're just uh, linear functionals on this real vector space. So they're elements of the dual space. They want to, you want them to take values between 0 and 1, i.e. probabilities, when you evaluate them on normalized states. Uh, we have this unit effect uh, whose value is 1 on the normalized states. So it's, it's one space just slices through this cone and cuts out the normalized states. Um, oops. Um, okay, and there's some minor technical conditions on the cone. Um, okay, sometimes people talk about restricting measurement outcomes to a sub-cone of the full dual cone. Uh, so they're not taking all of the effects that are sort of mathematically reasonable. Uh, and that's a way to get interesting effects in theories. Um, I'd say we're going to assume that um, we don't make that restriction. We allow all mathematically reasonable effects. And so I, I like to call the system with that property saturated. We, it's got everything it can hold in terms of measurements. Um, OK. Oh, yeah. Dynamics are normalization non-increasing positive maps. So they don't increase the value of this normalization functional u. And they take the cone of unnormalized states to itself, maybe to a less normalized state, because it could be a process that happens with probability less than 1. Uh, OK. A lot of times, people like to represent these effects, these elements of the dual cone, um, by actually uh, thinking of those elements of the same space as the states and representing functional evaluations to take an inner product. And then it's the inner product that gives you, gives you probabilities. Right? So if you represent quantum mechanics by taking effects as positive operators, density matrices as positive operators, the trace inner product is uh, the standard inner product you use, although there, you can use others. Um, OK. So GPTs are often represented that way. And then we could describe the dual cone. Um, we can define something called the internal dual cone. So it's the set of all elements that have non-negative inner product with the um, everything in the primal cone generated by the states. So similarly, if you just think about effects as elements of the dual cone, you can define the sorry elements of the dual space. You can define the dual cone there. It's a set of everything that has non-negative um, that is non-negative when it's evaluated on the primal cone, and that's just a prerequisite for uh, even having a chance of giving you probabilities. Um, OK. But if you define it in terms of this inner product, um, if you could find an inner product relative to which this internal dual cone actually is equal to the primal cone, um, then the primal cone is called self-dual. So that's a very strong um, constraint on the geometric structure of a system to have a self-dual cone of st unnormalized states. Um, and it's even stronger than just being affinely isomorphic to the dual cone. So the standard example is the square bit, which is the state space of you know, one wing of a PR box. Its dual cone is isomorphic to it, but rotated by 45 degrees. And there's no way to identify the primal and dual space via an inner product such that you can get the things to lie on top of each other. Um, OK. Um, examples. I think we've been clear enough about that. Um, OK. More geometric concepts that are going to be important um, so that we can state postulates that give rise to our majorization result. Uh, the notion of a face of a convex set. It's a subset of the convex set such that if you have something in the face and you can convex decompose it in terms of other stuff in the set, that other stuff also has to already be in the face. Um, OK, an exposed face, and all the ones we're interested in will actually be exposed, um, is the intersection of the convex set with a supporting hyperplane. So for example, let's say you have a classical 
classical um, three-state system. Its state space is just a built-in triangle. Okay, here's a supporting hyperplane. It picks out this exposed space, consisting of this point. Here's another exposed uh, supporting hyperplane. It picks out this face, this line segment. That's also a face. By convention, the whole thing is a face and the empty set are faces. That makes the set of faces a bounded <coughs> lattice according to the ordering that's given by just set inclusion. Thanks. Um, okay. The faces are important because, um, for instance, the set of things on which an effect is zero is a face, and the set of things states on which an effect is one um, is a face. So if you're interested in distinguishable sets of states, you're talking about faces, basically. Uh, okay, perfectly distinguishable states. That means there's some, uh, you know, effects E1 through EN, <coughs> such that when you evaluate them, uh, effect I on state J, you get delta IJ. So, perfectly tell you whether you have that state or not. And of course, these have to be a measurement or at least extendable to a measurement. So they add up to less than this normalization function. So the probabilities add up to less than one, or even more add up to one. Okay. Uh, so, we'll call a, a set of perfectly distinguishable states a frame. Okay, filters. Um, these are a convex abstraction of quantum mechanics projection postulate in Luder's version. Uh, so, that's rho goes to Q rho Q, where Q is the orthogonal projector onto a subspace of the Hilbert space. And what are the faces in quantum mechanics? They're the sets of density matrices whose support is entirely within a particular subspace of the Hilbert space. One to one map between faces and subspaces of the underlying building space. Um, okay, but we want to abstract this. Um, so we say it's a normalized positive linear map that's idempotent projector. Uh, and P and its dual are both complemented. What does complemented mean? There's a filter P prime such that the states in its image, in other words, the intersection image with the cone, are equal to the um, the same set as the states in the kernel of the complementary projector. So if you pass the filter, you fail its complementary filter, and vice versa. Uh, okay, normalized just means it's a reasonable physical thing. It doesn't increase normalization. Okay, this is the dual of a notion that Alfstein and Schultz introduced in the 70s. Uh, interesting fact about them, they're neutral, so if you're going to pass the filter, you're going to pass it undisturbed. Right? If, if the um, value of normalization is unchanged by, by the filter, then the filter doesn't change the state. Uh, we call it state space projective if every face is the positive part of the image of the filter. Uh, did you put up the 10 minute signs a little bit ago? Yeah. Because it was about, I thought it was about 35 past when I started. But maybe it was 25 past. Um, okay, a cone is perfect if every face is self-dual in its span according to the same inner product. So this is more general than, um, or sorry, this is this is much more special than just being self dual. There are self dual cones that aren't perfect. Um, but in a perfect corn cone, the orthogonal projection onto the span of the face is positive, um, and in fact, it's a filter. So perfection is going to be one of our axioms. It's pretty strong. Um, okay, the lattice of faces forms an orthocomplemented lattice. I guess I will skip the definition. Um, in fact, it's orthomodular. Um, that's true for a perfect cone. Uh, that's even just true for a cone that is projective, such that every face is the image of a filter. So it has this kind of generalized projection posture. Um, so for quantum logic people, okay, that's nice. Um, orthomodularity, okay, if you know what it is, that's great. Given the time, I won't define it. Uh, Let's talk about symmetry of transition probabilities. So that's another assumption that we can use um, sort of instead of assuming um, assuming perfection. It's a little more related to what Carl and Maria has been, has been talking about, and it's maybe a little more to it. So given projectivity for every um, atomic projective unit, so that's the image of you know, this order unit, the, the deterministic effect under the dual of a filter, um, the face, um, that's the image of the um, state space under the filter, uh, contains a single pure state. So atomic projective unit means that this is a minimal non-zero filter. 
Uh, it's projecting onto a face that consists of just the multiples of a single pure state. Um, so then we have a map, P to P hat. It's one to one um, from projective units, in other words, atomic effects, onto extremal points of um, the set of normalized states, onto pure states. Symmetry of transition probabilities. Um, and, and basically, this is the sort of thing that um, Carlo Maria was assuming, I believe, under his uh, pure sharpness axiom. Um, so this projectivity implies pure sharpness. Uh, symmetry of transition probabilities says that if we evaluate effect A on, um, sorry, did the map go? Yes. On the state given by um, mapping B to its corresponding, so B to its corresponding state, that's the same as applying the effect B to the image of A under, under this map. Um, so a self-dual projective cone has symmetry of transition probabilities. That's pretty trivial. Uh, something we rediscovered is the fact that project, if you have a projective cone, wherever you face this, that's the image of a filter, then symmetry of transition probabilities is equivalent to perfection. Um, so if you like, assume projectivity and symmetry of transition probabilities um, rather than perfection. Um, and maybe that's a, a more operationally motivated set of postulates. Um, symmetry of transition probabilities and some generalization of the projection postulate. OK, so to uh, state our majorization result then, uh, we need the, um, the postulates, the, the premises of the theorem. And one of them is unique spectrality. Every state has a decomposition into perfectly distinguishable pure states, and all such decompositions use the same probabilities. So this is the thing, for instance, that Carlo Maria uh, said they're going to is in the forthcoming paper. Not only do you have this um, decomposition, but the probabilities are unique. Uh, it's stronger than weak spectrality, which doesn't assume this. Okay, majorization has been defined by several people at this conference. A measurement is fine-grained if the effects in the measurement are on extremal rays of the cone. And those are just the rays generated by extremal points of the normalized state space. Extremal points, by the way, are just um, points that can't be written as non-trivial convex combinations of other points. Um, OK, so here's the main theorem that I'm going to describe. Um, let the system satisfy unique spectrality, symmetry of transition probabilities, and projectivity. Or, if you want to bundle some things together, you could just assume unique spectrality and perfection. Um, because of this theorem um, by Arati that we rediscovered, it's um, those the same set of assumptions, the equivalent sets of assumptions. So then for any state omega and any fine-grained measurement E1 through En, um, the vector of measurement probabilities is majorized by the vector of probabilities of outcomes for a spectral measurement. So that's where you're actually doing the measurement that distinguishes the distinguishable pure states um, in the convex decomposition of that system into distinguishable pure states. Um, so any measurement outcome probabilities for fine-grained measurements are more mixed than more random, have more entropy in any reasonable sense of entropy than uh, the spectral probabilities. Um, so that's important for having a thermodynamics that works well. At least I believe it's going to be important. Um, OK, so, so, so this is our main result. It's, it's just one step on the way to having a good thermodynamics for GPTs, having a set of postulates that give us a good thermo for GPTs. Um, it has as a corollary that if you can write the state as a mixture of reversible transformations of some other state, uh, then that mixture state is, is its spectrum is majorized by this. Um, yes, it's, it's sorry, its spectrum. Just make sure I get the direction right is majorized by that of the initial state. Um, all right, so at this point, uh, there are a few more uh, things that we could talk about. Um, let me just maybe talk a little bit about this strong, um, yeah, a characterization of, so this is the paper that um, 
Carlo referred to, um, in which we characterize quantum theory by four axioms. There's the weak spectrality, we didn't assume the uniqueness. Strong symmetry, which Carlo discussed, every set of perfectly distinguishable pure states goes to any other of the same size by a reversible transformation. That's like taking a basis to another basis uh, with a unitary in quantum theory. No irreducible three-slit interference. So this is something Raphael Sorkin defined, the hierarchy of orders of interference. Um, and quantum theory only has the second order of interference. Uh, and then energy observability. So this is saying systems have non-trivial, continuously parameterized reversible dynamics. And the generators of one parameter continuous summing groups, which you might think of as Hamiltonians in one sense, are actually, can be associated with non-trivial observables that are conserved by that dynamics. Um, with all four of these, you get complex quantum theory. With the first three, you get Jordan algebraic systems, which Alex will talk about later. Uh, and with the first two, you in fact get projective self-dual systems. Um, so you get, um, you get perfect cones. So even these first two just imply perfect cones. One more thing to point out, in the context of our first two postulates, this thing is equivalent to assuming that the filters preserve purity. So if you start with a state that is um, pure, even if it's not in the image of the filter, it gets disturbed because it's projected into the face, but it doesn't go to a multiple of a mixed state. It goes to a multiple of a pure state. And that is a case of the purity preservation axiom Carl Maria mentioned. Um, if you have the three slit or more interference in the context of our first two axioms, that's violated. I'm still interested in theories that might have that, um, have this higher order of interference. It's not absolutely clear to me they're not going to have decent thermodynamics. Um, so maybe, you know, look at one, two, and four, um, maybe you can still get some good thermodynamics. Um, so right, one and two imply, but are much stronger than the axioms we use to get our majorization result. So that's at least some hope of having decent Thermodynamics. This reversible transformation thing is very strong, but you use it when you try to think up thermodynamic protocols. So like von Neumann wants to, you know, put, put, put some like single particle gas into different boxes depending on its internal state, and then send all the internal states to one, one fixed pure state. Um, well, if you have, let's say, even the weak case where you can take any pure state to any other by reversible transformation, it might be reasonable to say, um, that's something you can do at no thermodynamic cost, as von Neumann assumed. So, all of these in some way seem like they might be relevant to decent thermo. Uh, this is the one that I'm hoping is not actually needed. Um, but there's a lot left to do, and uh, I guess I'll wrap it up with that. Okay, we have a minute or two for questions. If not, I'll, I'll ask one. Um, so uh, a lot of this focus on your work and Carl's, Carlo's work has been on deriving something like spectral theorem. Do we really need a spectral theorem to do thermodynamics? Well, I mean, so we so far have been sort of assuming the spectral theorem. Yeah. Um, but I, I, so I've sort of talked about a thermodynamics that's similar to quantum thermodynamics. You know, the, the less things you assume that are like quantum theory, you may still have resource theory, but it may be, um, you know, it may start looking quite different from uh, the theory that you have with spectra. But, but it might be, yeah, I, I think there's a good possibility that, that you can still say things. You know, you might not be able to say as much. Um, there might be more cases where you just can't say whether a transition would be done or not. Or, I don't know. But, but I, I think there's still a lot to be... Um, you know, investigated based on the assumption of the spectrum. I'm hoping that you can have spectral theories that are very far from quantum theory, but still have a lot of symmetry. Any other questions? Can you just say a bit more about this energy uh, observability, and in what sort of uh, scenarios is it, is it violated? Oh, um, thanks. Yeah, well, you see, um, the first three axioms allow Jordan algebraic systems, and those are basically real, complex, and quaternionic quantum theory, and anything whose state space is a ball, and three-dimensional octonionic quantum theory in finite dimensions. I mean, that's it. Um, 
all of them except um, complex quantum theory don't have that. Um, so, you know, for example, signal Y generates the reversible transformations of a rebit. Um, well, I guess it depends what you. But anyway, it's not observable um, in, in real quantum theory. The generator of the transformations of this, the, the rotations of this disk is not an observable. Um, so is that basically Stein's version of Stokes' theorem? Does that basically what? Um, I don't remember what Stone's theorem is offhand. Well, sure. It's a, it's a corresponding thing to what the spectral theorem is for. Okay, I'm still not clear what it is, so I'm not sure. In what context? Well, okay, so that would be then saying that it yes. does satisfy yes. it, yes. yes. But then, yes. but then, say, I don't think this theorem, I mean, that, yeah, okay, that would be saying that it, it, quantum theory has this property, yes. but that doesn't tell you what other systems may or may not. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not relevant to this question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then we better leave it there. Say thanks again to Howard.